Good morning. This is George Laird, Predictive Engineering, and I have online with me Kirk Fraser out of Quebec, Canada. Hi, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> what do you say? I put you on the spot. Quick, say something. Um, well, welcome to our seminar. Kirk, can you see my screen? You're sort of my auditor. Yeah, everything looks great. Good. So if you guys have any questions in French, Kirk can handle it on that side. And if you have any questions on Spanish, I get that side. So we got the good, good part of the romance language is covered. Um, the Kirk is is I've known him for about ten years, and he is one of my staff engineers on a part-time basis out of Quebec, and he's working on his PhD in SPH, smooth particle hydrodynamics, and he's going to give a a brief overview of some of his work that he's doing on that at the very end of the seminar. Yeah, well, uh, it's when you when I do these seminars, I know you guys are in listen mode. I have to talk, and Kurt's going to uh, chime in from time to time to make sure I, I stay on message. And also, if you have questions, you can type them in on the panel, and Kirk will, will try to respond to the questions. And if he doesn't have something quick to answer, we'll get back to it later. So, these are technical seminars, and I go through it pretty quickly. And uh, it's for engineering and for the support of the engineering community within Applied CAX. So today we're going to cover FEMAP and NX NASTRAN best practices. And I, Kirk is, when I first invited him, him in on this, he says, well, I'm not exactly a FEMAP guru on this. And I said, well, this concept is really for, it's software independent. It, it's just FEA best practices. And one of the driving reasons that, that uh, I put this together was that it just provided a nice summary of everything that we do within our consultancy and all the things that we've learned through the years. And it's, it'll be quite nice um, to, when we bring peop new people on board, say, okay, here's your starting point. Uh, look at this, review it, ask questions, and go through it. And it's, I think you guys, hopefully you'll find it also useful in that sense. And there's, there's quite a bit of stuff boiled down. So I'm going to jump in. And for you guys that may not, may come late, this is being recorded. And it will go up on our website in about a week once we've got to burn it and uh, set it up. So, Kirk, any questions? Hello, no, Kirk. I'm just sort of turning off my mic. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, so no, I don't have any questions. Everything's looking good. Good. So here's our introduction. These notes will be available with the download. And what I this is our short list. And, of course, you could have a lot longer list, and you could go on and on. And the point this is I often I, I class modeling errors as class 1, 2, and 3. Class 1 means basically you just got to admit you screwed up, roll over, and you're dead. There's, there's no escaping from a class 1. It's... You made a mistake in units, you made a mistake in loads, and it's gross. Uh, there's, there's no way to get around it. And those are big things. And if you've been modeling for a few years, you know to always check the very, very big stuff. It doesn't take long. Be done real quick. And it provides you a lot of coverage. Class two are more subtle. You could have a wrong plate thickness. You could have a, a beam element set up incorrectly. You could have an elastic modulus where the digits, maybe it's off 10, 20, 30%. Stuff like that won't kill you, won't kill the analysis, but it may give misleading results. And it's just part and parcel of being a modeler. Uh, you try to avoid the, those at, at any way. And a class three is, is one more of, uh, what would you say, quality appearance. You may be mislabeling something. There may be uh, poor model construction, uh, but it doesn't affect the analysis results. Uh, what we're going to cover today for best practices is how to avoid everything that's a class one error and make it really clean and really address a lot of things that will lay the foundation so that you can avoid making the class two errors. So. And one of my themes, if you guys have worked with me before, is to avoid complexity in your modeling because as you add complexity, it becomes more and more difficult to debug your model figure out what's going on 
So I, I really strive to make it as simple as possible. And one of the new technologies that's come out in the last, you may say new, last 10 years, uh, FEA were a very conservative bunch. Uh, so it's been around, it's been benchmarked, it's been proven, is gluing things together. And one of the things I, I do a fair bit of is I glue hexes to tets. Is I'll hex things that are hexable, and then I'll glue them, glue it up to the text, tet part. And uh, it's very useful for getting your model size down. So there's that is V11. I'm going to show that later. And there we go. I got a I got the go-to meeting pane showing getting in my way. So what I what I did on this is I just glued the two as I hexed this part that was real easy to hex and I glued it together. And on simple examples like this, it's, it's, well, there's no reason, but if you have a really big model, hexing on large components can really cut down the node count. And, and this comes up, people say, well, I don't really care. I, can, you know, I mesh 400,000 nodes. And it's just fine. Well, it's, it's really sweet. If you're, you can get a model to run in under a minute and you get good results you can you spend more time checking your model than sit for it to run plus oftentimes a hex mesh will give you smoother stress contours because integration points are all aligned uh, it's it can give you higher quality results faster then the second one is snapping plates to solids there's another glued connection and what you're doing is you're taking the edge of nodes, you're taking the, the nodes along the edge, and that's your slave set, and, and gluing them onto the solid. I keep coming back to that. I thought about when I left that open, whether I should have closed it or not. So, and these connections, they're really simple to set up. You have your edge nodes, and you can turn on the highlighter. There's the edge nodes, and there's the face. So you're just gluing an edge to a face that turn off the highlighter and I'm, what I'm doing I'm contouring the undeformed shape so you can see how much it, it sets up and I just did a normal modes analysis and this last little simple one is I'm just gluing a plate together and if I go up to this view style turn on thickness we can see it like this and that's one of the, also the one of the advantages is it it's not uncommon to where you're going to have these right angles or 30 degrees and you don't need to really finesse the model you just need to stick them together and, and that's the advantage of using these type of connections is that they're fast simple you got your face and you got your edge that is it's that that's, there's not much to it your slave is your edge nodes your master is the face so really basic all of this stuff in these in this seminar best practices we have we have it covered in detail within our web page for example people come up with hex meshing we have a whole seminar on hex meshing and also on all this assembly modeling stuff that I'm showing here gluing things together is under assembly model optimization and I can bring up that website uh, da, 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 da. Okay, going to predictive, going to resources, online seminars. And it's thinking a bit. It's whenever I do these seminars, there's always there's a lot of computational stuff going in the background. The, the, you only enter the username, and it is the correct capitalization of FEMAP and NXNASTER. And that's it. And that little username is within every email that I send out. It's within my signature block. And in here, we have all our online seminars set up. And it has the webinar movie, and the PDF of the seminar, and the example file. So we go along. Along this line of idealization and making efficient models is using multi-point constraint equations, RBE2s and RBE3. The RBE, RBE2s, I think most people that model, they get it. You know, RBE2, it's rigid. 
Another really elegant use is the yes, interpolation element, the RBE3. It's, it's more difficult to set up. It's a little sneaky. But it doesn't add rigidity into your structure. So if you're trying to build stuff where, where this, you have a optic station that sits up here that's loosely distributed onto the top, you can use an RBE3 to spatially place that mask up here and then smear the forces down here so it takes, it'll, it'll transfer the correct moments into the structure. That's one of the beauties of an RBE3. And we have a whole seminar on connections. And that was quite a bit of work that we did by going to modeling, small. And these files here that I'm showing, they're going to be on the website too. And so this is, this is the stuff that we did on seminars, on connections, 40 pages of RBE2, RBE3 of setting things up. So I, I go through this fairly fast. These are, I try to aim to get these seminars done in 30 minutes. And if you, if you guys have questions, four rounds, send us an email, say this wasn't clear, I'd like to know more of this or that. Um, this, is, this is part of our service to you guys.